ان الحمد لله رب العالمين هو الذي جعل المسلمين والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله الكريم وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله والسلام عليكم ان الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي جعل المسلمين I bet you thought this was going to be in English, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Well, let me ask you a question. Do we have anybody here that's a Muslim? Raise your hand. Uh-oh. Do we have anybody here that's not Muslim yet? Raise your hand. How do you like being surrounded by all these terrorists? <laughs> I meant Muslim. Did I say what I said? That slipped. Slips don't count and boys don't wear slips. Usually. Bismillah. Mm. Alhamdulillah. The program tonight is really designed to help dispel some of the mis- misunderstandings and uh, wrong notions that a lot of people have about Islam. and the muslims we particularly wanted to invite the folks of the community here that are not muslim that haven't had a chance to really sit with muslims or learn something about what it is we believe now i'm coming to you straight from the airport right now from brisbane and while i was there yesterday we took the opportunity to stop at a park where they have the koala bears to go to you get the have you ever held one they make you hold your hand like this and you hold them and then they put the those things are heavy <laughs> uh, you know you put it and it's like oh but while we were there i took the opportunity to get the video camera out and film for our show back home because we have a television show called bridge to faith and as i travel i collect a lot of footage and then if we can we try to work it into some of the programs and uh, one of the things my daughter has been on to me to do is to get more man on the street kind of thing you know where you ask people questions cuz people like that they want to see what the guy on the street his opinion and it's kind of funny when you stop and think about it some big event takes place and they just get any guy off the street to give his comments till they find something they like to stick it on there that's all it really is So with that in mind I stopped the lady who was at the the park with some kids and I and I asked her you know some things about the park and the animals and I asked her what do you do you know anything about Islam she said no not no <laughs> like this you know I said well do you know something about Muslim she said no she started her head shaking yes but then she'd say no cuz almost like uh no not really I said would well, you know any muslims oh yeah i know muslims i said uh, very well she said oh yeah yeah and i said well what's your opinion of muslims she said well i mean you know we get along real well we do this together they're very very nice and kind i said well, so what's your opinion of islam she said well, i don't know I said uh, cuz we never argued about that we didn't argue about the bible or anything I said so this is what her opinion is that we're going to argue with her about her bible. So there are, really there's a lot of people have a lot of wrong misconceptions. So what I usually do is try to emphasize the areas that we have in common because according to the Quran the book that we follow it tells us that the Christians are the closest to us in faith. Actually it says the people of the Ahlul Kitab but it's it's going to focus on the Masihi and the Nasrani because they are the ones the, the followers of Jesus are from them are going to be those who actually will uh be closer in a, a lot of ways because of their number one they believe in the tawhid uh, to an extent that they say la ilaha illallah to a point there's only one god and this is a good thing then unlike the jewish the jewish will stop with that because they're not going to accept jesus as 
a prophet or a miracle birth or anything like that. If they did, they wouldn't be Jews anymore. Anyway, they'd be Christians. So if you think about it, the closest to us is a Christian. They're missing some points in Tawhid. And they are missing one prophet, which is Muhammad Sallallahu So when I get the opportunity to break it down, I like to, to show where we're alike. And then in the areas where we're not alike, to just diagram it and let them see which they think is better. So in one of our programs, that is essentially what we have uh, on the Internet. You can just compare real easy and look and see that we have one God. He creates all of the heavens and earth in six days. We have that. Where there's a difference coming though is in the Genesis on the seventh day he rested. We don't have a seventh day. We just say after the sixth day it says he rose over his throne. So this is a benefit here that if you stop and think about it do you want the God that has to rest or the one that's ready to take over and do whatever he needs to do. So right away they'll say, hmm, that makes sense. We move then to the next area. We'll discuss what it is that they believe as far as the first man. The first man is created is Adam. From his bone, Allah creates his mate, which is Eve. Same thing in Islam, no problem with that. The devil comes and tempts them, same thing. Don't eat the fruit, they ate the fruit, same thing. Stories very familiar and very similar. Until we start to discuss a little bit about who's the one that's inspiring them to do this, which is the devil. Well, according to the Jewish faith, and of course then the Christian will pick that up because that's where they get their Old Testament from, the devil is a fallen angel. And if he's a fallen angel, this is a real strange thing for a Muslim because angels don't make mistakes. They cannot choose to disobey. They have to do what Allah wants them to do. So how do you now explain who is this, this guy, this devil? Where did he come from? Because he's a precursor to Adam. He existed before Adam. So how did that happen? Well, what we know from Islam and from the Quran that in fact he's from another species. The angels are created first. They have no free will. They only do what Allah wants them to do. The jinn are created next. And like humans, they have arms and heads and things like this. And they have uh, families. They get married. They have children. And they also have belief system of their own. They can believe what they want to believe. In other words, they can make choices. The angels, according to Islam, are made from nur, light. And the jinn are made from a smokeless fire. Means they have, that indicates heat, but again, there is no f smoke with it. So light, you don't see light. You see what light reflects off of, but you don't actually see light. And you don't see them, the angels or the jinn, because of their the way Allah has created them. Yet they're real. And this is who is coming to Adam and coming to Eve and trying to get them to disobey Allah. Okay, after that, this comparison, is, this is different. It's similar but different at the same time. After that, we find the very important story here is that Adam and Eve disobeyed God and they're put out of the paradise. It sounds exactly the same until you analyze the, the nuance of it. Because in the story in Islam, they're put out not because they sinned, but because that's what God was going to do anyway. He already knew they were going to do this. That's not the reason for kicking them out is to give a demonstration of something very important for us. Another point comes up that Adam is held responsible for what he did completely. There's no blaming Eve for what he did. Now, for the Christians, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Because 
there's quite a bit of dialogue in the book of Genesis blaming her for listening to the devil in the first place. Then she eats the fruit. Then she talks her husband into it. And so it's all her fault. In Islam, we're not allowed, number one, to blame other people for our mistakes. We can't. You did it, you did it. You don't say, oh, it's his fault. The reason I'm late today is because blah, blah, blah. No, you don't do that. That is not right in Islam to do this blaming. In addition to that, we find that in the Genesis, it, the book of Genesis, it's saying that Eve is now going to go through a menstrual cycle, she's, her monthly cycle, and this is a punishment. This is a punishment from God on her, and she's going to be uh, punished more when she has babies and all the, the... In fact, it's her monthly cycle is referred to in Christianity as a curse. The monthly cycle is called her time of the month is a curse. And when she has this baby with all this pain and agony, this is more punishment on her. And then, oh, why not throw some more sin... Not just on her, but on her offspring for ten generations for those that hate me. It says that God's telling them. And then on top of that, why not just go all the way and now anybody else born from them will be born in the original sin. Till the day of judgment. Now you got to wonder, that's some pretty powerful fruit they must have ate. I mean, that's heavy stuff. Watch this. I'm telling the Muslims, watch this. Somebody asks you, how come you can't eat pork? You say, well, it's in our Quran. Well, I don't care where it is. Why? What's the reason? What's the rationale? What's the logic? What would be your answer? And how come a woman has to wear this covering? What's the logic behind it? And you start to explain this and that, and they go, nah, I don't accept that. In today's world, there's too much problems and it's hot. You don't live in the desert anymore. You know, be modern. And why you got to pray five times a day? Well, God doesn't know what's in your heart. Huh? And why you have to go all the way to Mecca to do a pilgrimage? Well, God doesn't know where you are or you're lost. Or... They got all kinds of things like this. So what's the logic? Why bother? Now, we do have quite a bit of explanation that comes to us from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And there is uh, some very lovely work that's done even by some of our modern scholars today explaining what we call the rational arguments in the Quran for many things, especially the proof that God exists. This is a, one of the most beautiful aspects of Islam. You don't have a doubt. There's no doubt in the mind of the Muslim that God exists. We don't have that problem. But what do you say to somebody who comes to you with this wanting to have logical proof? The problem really is with the person himself because he's wanting to have proof on his own level. He wants you to make all the creation fit his thinking. In other words, if he's going to believe in a God, he's going to have to believe in a God that he invents in his head. And the only religion he's going to accept is one that he also invents in his head. So he's basically going to describe the God and he's going to describe what the proper relationship is with the God. Yeah? And then he'll be satisfied. And then if things don't work, he can always modify it right away. I changed my mind. God's not like that anymore. Now he's like something else that I like better. And I changed my mind. I'm not going to do this anymore. I used to be a vegetarian. Forget about that. I decided God doesn't mind if I eat a cow once in a while. You decided what God likes. That's pretty cool. And it means that really the person isn't taking very serious the notion of a real God. But the answer to the question is real simple. If somebody asks you in the future, what's the logic behind 
this thing or that thing, this commandment or that commandment. Hmm? You could ask them, do you believe that there's a God? Yeah. Do you believe that Adam is the first person? Yeah. And Adam and Eve ate the fruit? Yeah. And that was a sin? Yeah. Okay. As soon as you explain to me about this, I'm ready to talk to you about the rest of it. Why did God tell them not to eat fruit? Nowhere in all of that I've studied in the, the Hebrew, the Aramaic, the Kone Greek, has anybody explained what it was about this fruit from any authentic text I'm talking about, talking about this fruit, what it was that was so bad about it. Was it rancid? Was it spoiled? Was it something God was saving for himself for a snack for later? <laughs> Nobody has any answer. It's fruit. It's a fruit from a tree. That's it. Don't eat the fruit. Now, I did have some preachers try to explain that it was symbolic because they didn't want to use the word sex because they were so, you know, prudish and so, you know, humble and so, you know, they didn't want to use the word sex. Saying, uh, yeah, but that's Genesis, yeah? Didn't you read chapter 19 and didn't you read about the rape of Dinah and all the stuff they talked about and you know, the private parts and didn't you read? I mean, all of a sudden what happened? It's all in the same book. Suddenly you got things that I can't even say here in public. So, no, that's not it. Because we know also in Islam it was fruit. Don't eat the fruit of the tree. So, why? And you know and I know what it is. Real simple. You're being tested. Simple as that. If you see some of these old mystery movies, you know how they work? Where somebody's in a storm and they're going through the night and the car breaks down and they go to this big ugly old mansion that's standing there, lightning is flashing and there's somebody's going to let them in and it's real spooky, yeah? And okay, you can come in and you can stay the night, you can stay anywhere you want, but whatever you do, don't go in that door. Now what's the movie about? <laughs> what's the movie about? Is there any doubt in your mind before the movie's over, somebody's going in the door, right? I mean, that's, that's what the movie's about. And it's the same with a human being. Don't do it? Okay, I'm going to do it. The other thing is, when you're ordered to do something, and you don't do it. And actually, in Islam, we understand that that was the first big problem. Because the one we call, in Arabic, Iblis, and the Christians call him Lucifer, He's from the jinn, and he is the devil. He existed before Adam. He lived before Adam. And actually, he was in a very high-ranking position in that his worship brought him up on a level, or Allah raised him on the level of praying beside angels. And he was like, hey, see me? I pray with angels. This is arrogance. And he considered himself to be the best of the best. Then Allah started creating something. And he created this big thing. It had no head on it. Iblis went down inside all through him. And looked through. What is this thing? And he started feeling jealousy. Why Allah is spending all this time creating this thing? What's going on with this? When Allah completed Adam... Allah says about that, Allah khara khalaqna insana fi asani taqweem. That verily Allah created human beings in the best mold. And that's talking about Adam. And then what happens? Allah commands all the angels to make sajda. Put your head down on the ground. I don't use the word bow down here. Translators use bow down. But to bow is just like you know, like Japanese are bowing all the time. You see them like that? <laughs> yeah. But this is to put your head on the ground. It's sajda. And all the, all the angels made this prostration. Illa iblis. Except for a Lucifer. He didn't do it. He refused. And because of that, he became of the disbelievers. Now, if you understand in Arabic, it works. But in English, the English isn't strong enough to handle it. So it sounds strange. What it means is that 
It doesn't mean he didn't believe in God existing anymore. Because he still knows God exists. But he got out of the rank of those who have Iman. He's no longer a mu'min. And even though he knows there is a law, he's still a kafir. Because, and this helps a lot of people understand. It's not the word infidel in English that they often use and translate almost everything that's not Muslim in Quran. They say it translates in English to the word infidel. But actually, there's a, there are a lot of words, and it carries different meanings. In this case, what makes him a disbeliever? I mean, he was praying to God. He knows God exists. He knows God created Adam. So all of a sudden, when he knows God has ordered him to bow down. He doesn't bow down, and that makes him a disbeliever. Why? Well, because you don't have the word in the English language. You don't understand what it means. To be in a state of kuf doesn't mean you're ignorant. That would be jahil. Jahiliya, that's ignorant. But a state of kufr means to know and cover up. Whether it's subconscious or conscious, you know, but you're covering up. The word in English, cover, comes from the same word, kafir, in Arabic language. Oh, and it means the same thing. In fact, literally, a kafir is, and we're talking about before Islam, meant somebody who was a farmer. Because the people in agricultural, and we're not talking about people raising chickens now, we're talking about people who are doing agricultural work. Because they dig the ground, put the seeds in, and then what do they do next? Cover them up. And that act of covering, that is the exact act that's being described when you say kafir. From Kafara. And the proof of this, for those of you who don't know this, it, linguistically, it's exactly correct because in the Quran, Allah makes kufr. Allah makes kafara. Whenever you sin and then you repent to Allah, Allah makes kafara for you. He covers it up for you. Right? So in this case, what are you going to say? Allah is a kafir? Huh? It doesn't make sense, does it? So understand that the word means somebody knowingly is rejecting. It's not until after the clear proofs come to them that they're going to begin to argue about the points. This now, I'm telling the Muslims again, you can find in Surah Al-Bayna, chapter 98 of the Quran. It's talking about in the Ladina, those people who are from the Ahl Kitab, the people of the book, Jews and Christians. They didn't dispute with one another until after these clear proofs came to them. And they weren't ordered anything more than this. Worship God alone without any partners and keep the deen, the way, deen is way in English, keep it open, clear and pure for him. Establish the regular worship. Salah actually can be made to under... You, you can be... In Salah, one of the words is connect. Sal. To connect. So this is your chance to connect with your Lord. If you want to know how to talk to your Lord, you know you can just talk in your heart, Right? But if you want to make a formal, real connection so that you're proven to yourself that, hey, I'm really serious about what I'm doing here, this is when you go like this and do salah. This is connect. And it's also to be uh, pure and your. I'm trying to think of some English words that will explain this, this salah. But it's a beautiful thing and it's a lot bigger than prayer. Prayer, you know, there you can imagine somebody going, Oh, help me, help me, help me. It's not it's what salah, it's not about this dua when we make dua, help me, help me, yeah. But salah, you don't have it in Christianity, you don't have it in English, so you don't need a word for it. So anyway, that's what it's saying in the Quran that you've been commanded, the people before us were commanded that. Establish the Salah, pay the Zakat, which is the charity of Purdu, and then this is the deen or the way most clear. 
Now, there's a, a lot to cover on this, and so I'm going to jump now to a related topic, and that's salvation. The salvation in Islam. Because we have people tell us, you don't have Jesus on the cross. Oh, man, you don't have much of a religion. Well, if you thought about it logically, and I know that that's, for most people, logic is not a part of their religion anyway. But logically, how does that work? How does that work if I have dirty clothes... I'm just going to talk about clothes. If I got a lot of dirty clothes, some really, really dirty clothes, now I've got clothes that got stain and oil and maybe I had to change the tire, crawl under the car. I mean, we're talking seriously dirty clothes. And they're getting piled up really, really high. So much so, I'm thinking my washing machine can't even handle that. Let me go over to the dresser drawer and pull out my clean clothes and put those in there and wash those instead. Why not? Isn't that the same thing you're essentially saying? If the one without sin has to be punished for the ones that did the sin, that's kind of like, let me wash these clean clothes and then I don't have to wash the other ones. They'll be all right. Where's the logic? Now, if that's not upside down enough for you, and I was just talking about clothes, which there's no violence involved here whatsoever, just clothes. How about now you come home and you find that your children, yet you say five children, okay? Four of them have totally destroyed the house. Man, they broke the TV set. They broke out the windows. They're playing baseball in the house. They, you know, there's a Shetland pony standing in the kitchen. You're like, what in the world? The other, the fifth child, though, is sitting over there. And all he's doing is his homework and studying and everything like this, you know. And you walk over to these kids and you're telling them, what are you doing? They said, shut up, old man. <laughs> wow and you walk over to the other kid what are you doing dad I'm doing my homework alright that's it get over here <laughs> let's take the innocent one one he didn't do anything huh and we're going to punish him <sighs> we're going to put it on him so that we don't have to punish because I love the other ones <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to accept this no, I don't think so. You're going to say that man needs to be locked up. He's mentally ill. And while you're at it, lock up those kids too. Because they're pretty bad. But how would you accept this? And you wouldn't. If a human being did it, you would say this does not fit. This is not our society. This man is ill. Now we're not talking about washing clothes the wrong way. And we're not talking about punishing an innocent child here. We're talking about killing somebody. We're talking about killing somebody and saying that's your salvation. And not only that, you're saying you're killing a part of your God or you're killing your God. And you're asking us, how come we don't have something like that? Make sense? Well, let's look at what's the salvation in Islam. And while you're at it, make a note of what I'm saying. Pay attention real close. Make notes of this, and I want you to go to the psychiatrist and offer him what I said, and then tell him your story about... <laughs> yeah, just tell him whatever you want. <laughs> Islam is teaching us that human beings are born innocent, not guilty. They're born how? Yeah. The Prophet wasalam, taught us that human beings are born on the fitra of al-Islam. It means that they are born on the natural inclination to already be in a state of aslama. The verb for Islam is aslama, and it means surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace. And whoever surrenders to God, obeys His commandments, and submits to Him completely and sincerely, Meaning they would do it even if nobody else knew. Meaning they would do it even if nobody else cared. Meaning that even if nobody else could see them, they would still do what they said they would do. And then finally they're going to be in peace with what the results of this uh, uh, comes about. Meaning that the person who has done all of this, then 
They still have a bad circumstance, but they're going to be at peace with it. That's Islam. And who does it? It's a Mu Islam. Mu Islam. So if you believe in Almighty Allah, and He's one, and you want your relationship to be like I just described, even if you don't know Arabic, even if you never heard of the Quran, even if you live on a desert island, never even heard of God at all, you could still, according to Islam, you could still be in the right way with no difficulty. And I asked a Catholic priest about this. And what about the one who's on the desert island? How could they be saved? Because they can't be christened and they can't be, you know, have the cross put on, holy water, or blessings. They can't have any of that. Could they be Catholic? He said, no. I said, then how could they be saved on the day of judgment? He said, well, let's talk about something else. <laughs> because after all, and this is good. He's right in this. How many people do you know that live on desert islands that don't know anybody? Okay, good point. I don't know anybody like that or else they would know me, right? So, okay, we'll leave the subject. But he doesn't have an answer. I asked a Protestant preacher about the same subject and he told me if they don't pronounce the name of Jesus, they're going to go to hell. That's what he said. You have to pronounce the name. I said, and how do you pronounce it? He said, Jesus. I said, you're sure? He said, yeah. I said, did you know that the one you're talking about, the one that was the miracle birth from Almighty God, never ever said that word in his life? So I guess Jesus himself can't be saved. Because his name wasn't Jesus until after they Latinized the word Isa. His name in Hebrew is pronounced Isha or Yeshua, and it's Isa in Arabic, and the reason for that is because the difference between Hebrew and Arabic on this point is seen and sheen are reversed. That's why they say shalom and we say salam, but it's the exact same word. Also, they have a different kind of a... We have two T's in Arabic, ta and ta. One, you smile when you say it. <laughs> but they have ta and they have tha. That's why when we say bait, they say bith. Bith and bait. Did you know that? And El is meaning God. Beth El meant house of God. Beth El. And or the, because a lot of times you understand it. Allah, it has the whole thing. And we'll say Al means the. They'll say El representing Allah. Because they don't put the whole thing down. They consider that sacrilege to write the whole word. So that's where they come up with the L. So Bethel, house of God. How about this one? Bethlehem. <coughs> Bethlehem. Exactly. Bethlehem. What is Bethlehem? It's a place where they slaughter animals. Yes? Yeah. And that's exactly the place, the story that's in the New Testament telling about where Jesus' mother was taken and they were in Bethlehem because this is where they were enumerating or doing the human inventory census of the time and that was where they slaughtered the animals. Bethlehem. Bethlehem. It's important for us, I think, to know these words so that when we're explaining to others they can see the connection and you can see where people got the misunderstandings of things. For sure, our understanding, though, of salvation is this. Human beings are born in the right condition. But it's after they're old enough to make choices that they'll be held accountable. So children are born how? Innocent. Innocent as a newborn baby. Exactly. The expression is exactly what we believe. And how, when you hold a baby, you look at a baby... I mean, I was holding those koala bears, but look at a baby. And they're so cute. How would you say this baby's a sinner, born in sin? How? It doesn't make any sense. And Islam is teaching us a very important subject. If the baby dies, where does the baby go? Immediately. Paradise. Does the baby go in front of judgment or anything? No. Babies go to paradise. Now, does it depend on the religion of the parents? Huh? 
A Hindu mother loses her child and you can tell her the baby went where? Paradise, no doubt. A Buddhist woman loses her child. Her child went, same place. Muslim woman, Christian woman, Jewish woman, atheist woman. Still the baby went to paradise, yes or no? Why? Because the children are not held accountable for the sins of the mothers and fathers. Which one do you like better? Stop and think, and I've worked as a chaplain for a lot of years, to imagine that you have to console somebody who just lost their child, huh? And, oh, you've lost your child, we're really sorry about that. We'd like to pray for your child. But by the way, what religion are you? Oh, really? Okay, well, we can't pray for your kid. Because your kid went to hell. Sorry. Next. How would it feel? Do you want to talk to somebody like that? Now, since the Muslims have been hammering on this subject for the past few years, I heard the priests change what they say now. I work with some priests, you know, and they say, well, now we're saying so-and-so, and, you know, uh, God is merciful. Well, they have, don't tell us about it. We know it throughout the Quran, ar-Rahman, ar rahim We even have two kinds of merciful, the general mercy, Rahma, and then the specific mercy, which is Rahim. You want to tell us about it? Okay, yeah. He said, so uh, in most cases, the baby will go to paradise. They've said that now. Most. We're saying 100%. There's no difference because they're babies. And you ask them, well, what about the original sin? Well, maybe they weren't old enough to get it yet. So it's a disease. <laughs> or is it hereditary? How does it work? Well, anyhow, I don't want to belabor that too much, but just to show you, watch this. Now, how does it come, how does it come, this verse in the Quran, when Allah says that He never changes the condition of a people until the people change themselves. He doesn't change the condition of a people until the people change themselves. Ordinarily, we'll talk about the condition of the Muslims today and we'll say, why are we in the condition that we're in? Why? Why are we suffering everywhere? What, what about Iraq? What about in uh, Afghanistan? And what about Kashmir? What about all Palestine, for instance? All the problems that we got. But when it comes right down to it, why would God let this happen to the Muslims? Ah. Uh, we could ask, what's wrong with our relationship with our Lord? And we'd have the answer, wouldn't we? Yeah. Because remember what I said when we started the program. We're not allowed to blame other people anyway. You can't blame the Jews, the Christians, the atheists, the Zionists. You can't blame others for your condition. You can hold people responsible for what they do. We're not stupid. But the real blame, if you want to do blaming, comes on who? Ah. And what's the proof? Who knows where's the proof? La ilaha illa ante supanaka inekuntu mene dalameen. What we're finding here is that this is the dua or the prayer offered by Jonah, the one in the whale. You know the story of Jonah in the whale, yeah? How did he get in the whale? He left his post. He was in Nineveh. He was supposed to be there telling the people about... God, to change from their false worship to the worship of the one God. But none of them would listen. And he got fed up and he knew that it was a matter of time that Allah was going to destroy them all and he couldn't take it anymore and he left. So he went out, got on the boat, went out to sea and then went overboard in the storm. Whale swallowed him, went down to the bottom. Bible says three days, three nights. We know it was longer than that, but who cares? Two seconds is too long for me to be in the belly of a whale. <laughs> That's the kind of prison you don't want. We're talking about real isolation. We're talking about really, here's your dungeon is digesting you. But in that condition, and unfortunately, even though they have a whole entire book dedicated to this story in the Old Testament called the book of Jonah, they left that part out of it. Because it's still in the Quran, we know what he said. And this is the key for us, for salvation. La ilaha illa ante supanik. 
any kuntumini dalami. There's none to worship except you. The glory is to you. And the wrongdoing, I did it to myself. Ask a psychiatrist if this is good thinking. If somebody's an alcoholic and they join AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, they come out and say, I'm John Smith, I'm an alcoholic. It's the first thing they do in their little gatherings, don't they? Well, if his name's not John Smith. But they have to tell the truth. That's one, a very important thing. Admit what you're all about. Uh, um, we don't have to do it publicly, but we have to admit to ourselves and to Allah. And when we do that, that's the first step of getting well. It's my fault. I did it to myself. And I'm ready to make tawbah. That's the second step of salvation for the Muslim, to go back. You know what tawbah is? It's when you're going down the street and you look up and you see all those wrong way signs. You know you're going the wrong way? You're going, oh my God. It's a one way street. Huh? And you're looking around and your wife's like, you're on a one way street. Now you're going to try to, you know, cover it up. You say, well, I'm only going one way. <laughs> yeah, right. Finally, you have to admit it though, don't you? And you do what? You make tawbah. Turn around. Do a U-turn. Go back to who? To Allah. And this is tawbah. This is the true repenting to go back to him and apologize, ask for forgiveness, and then what? Don't do it anymore. Make sense? And hope that he'll forgive you. And if you're sincere, you don't do it anymore, good chance you'll be forgiven. Now, which do you like better? What I just described, is it mentally balanced to say, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, I want to make restitution for what I did. Huh? Or is it right to say, okay, even though I wiped out a bunch of people, I did this, I did that. So, uh, judge, you're innocent, let's kill you. Which makes sense. Because the, basically, that, that is the big difference in salvation. We don't need somebody else to die for our sins. It is mentally unhealthy, and it has brought about a lot of problems in our earth today. This kind of thinking has destroyed human lives wholesale. And if you doubt what I just said, I'd invite you to go and consider what's been happening ever since this mentality, especially under the Catholic Church at certain times. Certainly not the ones today, they're so lovely. But I'm talking about the time of the Crusades, the time of the Inquisition, and go look and see how that works. Now, here's another misconception a lot of people ask us about. They say, Islam is spread with a sword. Have you ever heard that one? You heard it? I want you to be honest with yourself and ask yourself, is it possible, is it possible to force, force someone to be sincere? If you say yes, that means you don't understand the words. You didn't understand the sentence. If you force someone to willingly love you, how? I'm sorry. I mean, this is my language, English, but I don't see how you got that. Islam means that you made the choice willingly and sincerely to worship Allah alone without any partners. You want to do His will, not your will. You want God's will on earth, not yours. Is that what Jesus called for in the Bible? Yes or no? God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Did He say it? According to their Bible, that's what He said. Well, that's one of the best descriptions of the word Islam there is. But how could you force somebody to do that? And according to the stories that they have, even in their own Bible, did Jesus force anybody? Did he? How can you force people to love God? How? Now, let's look at this. We use the word sword, so let's find out something. In the Arabic language, there's more than one word for sword. Did you know that? We have safe, that's the most famous, safe, right? Muhanid, 
Hosam, and the list goes on. It's like 13 or 16 different words for sword. There are common words that are used a lot. Right? So let us take a concordance of the Bible and a concordance of the Quran. If you don't know what that is, it's where you have every single word listed. Now from the, the Hebrew, we don't really know because we don't have the original text. From the Aramaic, we don't really know because we don't have the original text. What we do have, though, is the concordance in English by Strong. Strong's concordance of the King James Version. So this is what I'm relying on now. And if you find something else, you know, you can let me know in an email. But we'll take Strong's concordance, open it up, and we'll go through and only sword. I won't take anything else. We're not going to use dagger or any of that. Just sword. Because that's what Islam is accused of. And we'll count how many times the word sword appears and where it appears in the Bible. And it's about 200. And most of it's in the New Testament. Listen to this statement. Don't think I came with peace. I came not with peace, but with the sword. Which religion do you think that's in? New Testament. Oops. Oops. Or, this is the time... To sell your coat or your cloak and buy a sword. Which religion is this in? New Testament. Ooh, okay. And after somebody's ear gets cut off, the slave of one of the Pharisees' ear gets cut off, at Gethsemane, put down your swords, and now whoever lives by the sword dies by the sword, and this is where, again, New Testament. Now, Let's take all the words that we know in Arabic for sword, all the variations of sword, and we'll go to the Quran, concordance, and we do have the original. We know exactly what it said 1,400 years ago. So let us look through there in Arabic and see how many times any of these words come up and the grand total is zero. I'm sorry? Yeah, I thought you said that. <laughs> Zero. Ouch. So which, I'm going to ask you again, which makes better sense? Which makes better sense? In fact, the clear statement in the Quran says, La ikraha fidin. What does that mean? La means no. That's the first thing we say. La ilaha illallah. No gods except the law. This says, La ikraha fideen. There is no compulsion. There is no forcing in the deen. What does deen mean? Religion? La. Religion means way. I mean, deen means way. Religion means the fear of the gods. It's closer to taqwa. Except that it's plural. So let us consider... Deen, meaning the way to get to Allah. Does it make sense? Your way is your deen. Doesn't mean religion. Does it? Okay. Christians have a deen, yes or no? Yeah, okay. Jews? Hindus? Huh? Buddhists? Atheists? Everybody has to have one because you said to the atheists, Lekum dinakum waliya deen. How are you going to say that if he doesn't have one? So everybody has a deen. But it doesn't mean it's the right one, does it? Everybody has a way. And in fact, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, even drew a straight line in the dirt. He said, this is a straight path to Allah. He drew angles off of it and he said, these are the deviant groups that break off from it. And go different directions, these schisms. And all of them have a devil calling to it. Yeah? You know what archaeologists used to tell us? They used to tell us that the idea of one God only became popular very recently. Like in the last few thousand years that always before that was popular was the notion of many gods. Tree gods, rock gods, stone gods, stone to gods, all kinds of gods that they had. But the idea of one god was only popular maybe a few thousand years ago. They're talking about Judaism. 
But now recently, in the last couple of decades, archaeological studies have shown them that, guess what? The oldest and the first of all beliefs was one God. One God. This would be true, and by the way, I found this, the Native American Indians believed in one God. Even though the, the white man attributed to them these totem poles, they said those totem poles did not represent gods to us. You know what a totem pole is, right? Got those heads on it, stands up, got a little weird stuff on it. They said those were like street signs to us. It told us that when you came to one, you know, this such a tribe over here, these people over there, and it was kind of like a marker, but not something to worship. The Maori people of New Zealand, when I was over there last week and we talked with them, we found that they also had some beautiful beliefs from a long time ago. When I was in South Africa three weeks before, I found that the people of the Zulu tribe over there, they even have a statement, Umkulumkulu, that's it, Umkulumkulu. Anybody know Zulu? They don't know it? It's very similar to Allahu Akbar. And they believed in one God. So the belief originally is one God. And then people made these schisms to these other religions and made up man-made religions. So the Muslims are going to be the first to say what? We reject man-made religions. All of them. There's no man-made religion that we're going to accept. We're not going to accept any way. Let's go to the word deen. No way except Allah's way. So if we don't have it from Allah, we're not going to take it. If we can't prove it from Allah, we're going to leave it. Does that make sense? So I'm going to wrap it up really by coming back to this one point. That while the Christians are the closest to us in belief, there are many of them who claim to be Christian, but they really are what? Fasikun, disobedient to Almighty Allah. This is a statement in the Quran itself. How many of you know where it is? Anybody? You know where it is? Where is it? What surah? Uh uh. Uh uh. Listen to it. I'll give you the first part and then you'll remember it. كُنْتَنْ خَيْرَ أُمَتٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمَرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْحَوْنَ عَنْهِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ Where is it? Al Imran, exactly. And then that's the first half of the verse. وَاللَّهُ أَمَنَ أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ And if the people of the book had believed لَخَنَ خَيْرَ لَكُمْ It would have been better for them. مِنْ هُمْ From them are those who have Iman but Akhtarahum, most of them are Fasikun. They are disobedient. Is that right or wrong? Close? It's exact, isn't it? <laughs> so what I'm telling you is that we have still today with us the original. And by the way, for the benefit of those of you who didn't, don't know much about Islam, you heard the brothers, uh, we didn't rehearse this by the way, I just got off the airplane. How do they know exactly what verses I'm talking about? Because Muslims only have one book. And we know the original, and we memorize it in the original language. While Arabs only comprise about 12% of the Muslims in the world today, 88% of us are not Arabs, but we still use the Arabic of the Quran. And that's the Quran, not any translation. True or false? Just for fun, how many of you here have memorized the entire Quran? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you have the whole Quran. And I can't see you very good, so you get your hand up so I can see it. How many? Okay, one. Well, bro, well th this is only about half of the crew. We got everybody else in these other rooms. How many of you memorized at least Juzaama? Put your hand up. Okay, cool. How many, Jews, it comprises about 40 chapters, the last 40 chapters. How many memorized 10 chapters of the Quran, those 10 surahs? Now, come on, that's everybody in here that you know that. Yeah. 
Is there anybody who didn't memorize any of the Quran? No, we have to. Everybody knows how to say Bismillah. <laughs> ask other religions, ask them, how many people have you ever met that memorized the entire book that you have? And they'll go, huh? Why would you do that? Or how many in this room would want right now to be able to memorize the whole Quran? Yeah, I did this in Indiana. And I asked, how many would like to memorize the whole Bible? And I had a pastor sitting right next to me. And he went, why? <laughs> it's a whole different world, isn't it? A whole different world. But we invite, we invite our Christian brothers and sisters to consider what Islam really offers. As far as the statement that I was talking about from the Quran, I asked a pastor about this subject. What would you say? I didn't tell him it's in the Quran. I said, what would you say if somebody said, from the Christians, there are Jews and Christians, there are some real believers out there. They believe in God and they're trying their best. He said, that'd be true. I said, but what if somebody said, but most of them are disobedient. He said, that'd be 100% right. That's what he said. And I said, how you get that? Now watch this. Ten commandments. Actually, there are over 200 commandments in one area, 700 in another area of the Old Testament. But let's just take the popular ten commandments, which some today thought it was the ten suggestions. But the first one says, Thou shalt not have any other gods beside me. What does that mean? La ilaha illallah. What else could that mean? No other gods beside Allah. What does that mean? Three? How? How can you say that there's more than one God? How? Well, we're not. We're saying God is one. But, you know, he's a, he's a son and he's a father at the same time. How do you explain that? Can you be your own father? Whoa. That's, that takes some really weird thinking. I'm sorry. And then you throw in a ghost. Holy Spirit. They changed it. They used to call it ghost, but they don't. Because it does say ruh. In the, in the Aramaic. So it's ruh, which we know is not ghost, it's spirit. So that, to be fair, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. How? It's because they have been brought up to believe it over and over and over, indoctrinated, saying the same thing over and over. And do you know if you tell a lie long enough and repeat it long enough, you can get people to believe it? That was one of the planks of the Communist Manifesto. Tell a lie, make it bigger, tell it often. And it worked. A lot of people bought into the stuff. At that same place in Indiana I just told you about, where the pastor was there, I said, you've been brought up in a religion where you've been lied to from the first day. The society is lying to you all the time. Now here's where they took exception to me and they were like, no, that's not true. I said, I want you to challenge me. I, I wanted you to say that. I'm glad you're paying attention. When you were growing up, didn't your mother lie to you? No. Your father lied to you? No. Teachers, preachers all lied to you? No. Grandmothers lied to you? My grandmother? No way. <laughs> Not my grandmother. I said, okay. How old were you when you found out there was no Santa Claus. <laughs> Ouch. That's got to hurt. And the next thing you're going to tell me, there's no Easter Bunny running around laying colored eggs. <laughs> Oops. And when I said this, you should have seen their heads. They all went... <clears throat> They didn't want to look at me anymore because they realized what I said is true. And then I narrated to them what had happened to me. I came home from school in December. I was about nine years old. And my mother had always been real strong on the Christmas stuff and the trees and the gifts and, you know, and 
heavy duty on this stuff. Santa Claus coming down the chimney. The year prior to that, when we moved to Texas, we moved into one of these trailers, you know, this small trailer thing. And it was December. And I was worried. I said, Mom, we can't live in that place. She said, why? I said, it's Christmas time. She said, well, and we can get a small tree. I said, never mind the tree. There's no chimney. How Santa Claus is going to bring my presents? She said, no, no, don't worry. See that little... She pointed to the stovepipe up there. She said, you got a stovepipe. I'm going, I thought he's a big fat guy. How is he going to get in there? Listen to the answer. He's Santa Claus. He can do anything. Hmm? Watch what happens, watch what happens when you start teaching these kids that kind of stuff and then they listen to that song, Santa Claus is coming to town. He knows everything. He knows when you've been bad or good. Huh? He knows everything. He's everywhere. Huh? It says some kind of God to them. If you stop and think about a little kid, that's what he's believing in. And when he gets presents from Santa Claus, and where is Santa Claus? He's up. Look what's happening. The danger of teaching kids this lie. And then what happens? And I came home that next year and I'm ready to be vindicated, right? I come to my mother. Mother, what's the matter? She's washing dishes. I said, Mother, you got to go to school with me. What's the matter? I want you to come straighten out the kids. Some of the kids are what they said. She said, what did they say? They said there's no Santa Claus. She didn't look up. She said, don't tell your sisters. <laughs> Huh? I didn't believe it. I ran to my bedroom and I started crying because I th not because just the presence and all the rest of it, because my mother had become, you know, persuaded by the dark side. She went over to the wrong side. Because I was still convinced there's a Santa Claus, but my mother is lost. <laughs> because how could it be? No, the rationale kicked in. I said, uh uh. It wouldn't be that two people would tell the same lie. Why would it be that my father's telling the same lie? And my uncles and cousins. My teachers and preachers. Huh? How? Wait a minute. And my grandmother. No way. I wanted to call her long distance. I'm going to back in those days, you didn't make long distance phone calls unless somebody died. But I wanted to call her. I just wanted her to say, you know, Tell my mother, you know, straighten her out because we got to get her back. <laughs> I don't want to belabor it anymore and I already did. I just want to let you know something. That's serious. Because once the child realizes and comes to the, the reality of what this means, what's next? Because they've been fooled and made a fool of in front of their friends, it's kind of like, April Fool, ha, ha, ha. There's no Santa Claus. Now what? Now what? So now you want me to believe in the Easter Bunny? No way, forget that. Now you're going to come to him and tell him about a man can be born to a woman with no husband. No husband. And he thinks about it and he said, well, that's pretty common in New York. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all the time. Yeah, my cousin, you know, she... <laughs> so the whole thing of the miracle birth is like nothing to them now, isn't it? They, they have a whole rotten attitude now. And now you want to come to them and start telling them about how Jesus is with God and he's coming back in the last day. Are they going to buy that? No. And you start talking about miracles, even of Moses. And I've heard them. I heard some of scholars, so-called scholars, saying, well, you know, they claim that Moses parted the waters. Probably what happened, it was the Nile River. This is one of the things that they say. It was probably the Nile River, and it just dried up that one year or something, and they walked across it. That's exactly what I heard. Clearly it says, in the Bible, it was the Red Sea. And clearly it says the same thing in the Quran. We have no doubt it was the Red Sea. And it was parted. Not by Moses, by Allah. But Moses struck it with his stick. It opened up. And the children of Israel went through it. This was a miracle. 
Mu'ajza. Jesus walking on the water is a miracle. These things the Muslim has no trouble believing in. We believe that Muhammad sallallahu went all the way up to paradise and back down in the same night. We don't doubt it. But then nobody started lying to us at early age on about things that really have nothing to do with religion and tried to incorporate it in religion. There's two things I'm doing at the same time right now in this last part of my talk. I'm talking to our non-Muslim guests that are with us and us as well. The value of always telling the truth, especially about religion. It's forbidden in Islam to even joke. We can't even joke about our religion, much less lie. Whoever lies about our religion, Allah will start the hellfire with these people. The scholars of Islam who speak it and talk about it, but they don't live it, they're going to be the first to be burned by the hell. And the ones who are lying about the religion, when they know better, they're not getting out of the hellfire. There's no room for that. So that's why you'll find many times you ask a Muslim a question, he'll say, well, I don't know, but we can try to find the answer. Or you ask some people of other religions something, they'll make up something. Why not? Hey, it doesn't matter. Why shouldn't I make it up? The priests do. In some religions. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Hu Allah the Jalan Muslimin The praise is to Allah He's the one who guides to the straight path Whoever wants to be guided Can be guided But it's up to them Not me, not you We cannot guide anybody Allah says, and I'm going to end with this That You don't guide who you love But rather Allah guides Whoever he wills To his straight path so, in closing, my prayer for all of us is, Allah guide us. Amen.